This video was sponsored by Paperlike. A couple months ago, I put out a video. Okay, apparently it's been a while. I put out a video where I talked about a problem I was stuck on for my research. A problem that three years later, I still hadn't resolved. And so I knew about this issue, this problem for quite a while. I just didn't know how to solve it. Uh, and so after trying a bunch of ideas that I had, I had one more final idea that was simpler than all of the other ones. So I flipped on the camera and figured you guys would either see me win one or you'd see how I handle implementing another failed idea, which does happen a lot. I don't want to pretend like it doesn't. And I thought either case might be useful to see. It's all in the spirit of the channel. Now that video is linked in the description if you want more of an explanation, but to give you guys the spark notes, I study these things called gravitational form factors which we think are related to how things like energy, pressure, shear force, and spin are distributed inside of a particle. And they're called gravitational form factors because they're related to the energy momentum tensor, which is the right-hand side of Einstein's field equations for gravity. Now, I primarily just study the A and the D term right now, and the A term, which has to do with the energy distribution, has to satisfy a very specific normalization condition, which is that A of zero has to equal one. Roughly speaking, it means that in the rest frame of the particle, when it's not really being hit, the total energy is its mass energy. So there's not really much room to budge there, and that condition was the bane of my theoretical existence for quite some time. But after zeroing in on a specific section of the calculation where I thought the problem child could reside, I noticed that there were two Feynman diagrams that were related that had seemingly conflicting combinatorics, which is a fancy way of saying, I think I up counting somewhere. The counting, by the way, was basically accounting for all of the different ways you can arrive at the same Feynman diagram. And to spoil the ending, that did end up being the problem, and as a consequence of fixing it, A of zero equals one. So I was able to go to my advisor, convince him that we now had the combinatorics correct, and more importantly to me, convince him that I wasn't just seeing what I wanted to see because it solved the problem. But now, eight months has apparently gone by without my consent, so I think that that warrants a bit of an update on the project and what else I've been doing in physics. Well, first, I feel like in learning how to troubleshoot my own calculation, especially one of this magnitude, I had to develop more intuition regarding how certain Feynman diagrams combine and more technical details regarding local operator insertions. And this is all because I had to go back and stare at this 50 plus page calculation, which I love reminding people of and make educated guesses on where I thought the error could be. And in order to do that, I had to think more about what I expected to happen, which Feynman diagram should combine to give zero identically, and which one should probably give a finite remainder, things like that. Basically, I learned a lot more about renormalization to make sure I didn't do it wrong. Uh, but it'll still be a huge time saver in the future, especially when it comes to managing calculations of this size, because it gives me more sanity checks along the way instead of just calculating the same diagram four or five times just to be safe. But now it actually feels like I'd be able to speed run the same calculation in a different model, which I might actually get the chance to do. So that'd be great to see how much more efficiently I can, I can solve this problem. Um, I'd love to be able to talk more calculational detail. I'll be able to do it once the paper is submitted, but I just can't do it yet. Can't risk getting scooped. But now that we have the gravitational form factors, we can relate them to the densities like energy, pressure, and shear force, at least in one definition, by taking various three-dimensional Fourier transforms of the form factors. This is pretty analogous to what you would do in, say, quantum electrodynamics, where you have the electromagnetic current, which is Fourier transformed, or its form factors are, to be related to the charge density and the magnetic moment in the bright frame under some limits. So this is not a perfect definition. It's not Lorentz invariant. It's subject to relativistic corrections that can be systematically calculated, but it's something we can calculate. Now you may hear Fourier transforms and say, oh, well, that, that sounds easy enough. Just break out a sheet of paper or at least something paper-like and oh, this is the segue to the sponsor. Huge thanks to Paperlike for sponsoring this video. Today I'm going to be testing out one of their screen protectors. In particular, this is for the 10.9 inch iPad, which is supposed to make writing on your tablet feel like you're writing on actual paper. And so I'm going to be trying this out while I tell you guys about an exercise I've been working on in preparation for my research project over at Los Alamos National Lab. And then I'll give you my final impression of the screen protector afterwards. So the research project I'm about to start is in something called soft collinear effective theory, which I've talked about briefly in this previous video. 
Uh, but regardless of what effective theory you may be interested in, you're probably interested in calculating cross-sections at the end of the day. That's the main interface with experiment. Calculating probabilities that if you scatter particles a certain way, this is the distribution of particles you kind of see in your final state. So in soft collinear effective theory, this cross-section, sigma of tau, which already implies that in the final state we're looking at like jets of particles that are being produced, smash electrons into protons and these collimated streams of particles come out. So this cross-section, this, this thrust distribution can be expressed in terms of what's called a hard part and then a bunch of integrals, uh, dr1 squared, dr2 squared, dk, and then we have uh, a jet function, so times a jet function, r1 squared, jet function r2 squared, and then a, a non-perturbative soft part, s of k, and then a delta function. What is it? q squared tau minus r1 squared minus r2 squared minus qk. All right, so the, uh, the hard part, the h, describes like the partonic scattering off of, say, quarks and gluons inside of the proton. Uh, the jet functions describe the evolution of the produced uh, quarks into the jet of particles that is seen in the final state. And then the soft function sort of describes the, the soft color exchange between jets and things like that and is responsible for hadronization. Uh, so this is, this is the cross section, it involves these integrals, and the main, one of the main exercises that I'm working on, which is problem 36, uh, what is it, 36.7 I suppose, in Schwartz which is a QFT book. The first one is to show that if you take the Laplace transformation of this cross-section, so I do some sigma of nu, that it just becomes that hard part times the Laplace transformed jet function, so let's call that of nu, squared times the Laplace transformed soft function. And so you get a much simpler expression of the cross-section. You basically show that you use the delta function and it becomes a product of Laplace transforms. Part B that I want to do is show how the renormalization group equations change in this Laplace space. So I'm not going to try to do this from memory, but the RGEs for the jet function, mu dj of p squared mu d mu, in momentum space is, is pretty complicated. You've got alpha s, which also depends on mu, uh, color factor, over p squared minus q squared. So this is the renormalization group equation for the jet function. Uh, it, it basically describes how the jet function evolves as you look at it for different scale, as your experiments take place at like different energies. And it's non-local. It's not just j of p squared. You also have it evaluated at q squared and integrated over that. And so it's a pretty ugly differential equation. It's an integral differential equation. And if you take the Laplace transform, and my research advisor at LANL has given me hints saying I want to use things called like plus distributions as well, but basically, if you take this equation and take the Laplace transformation of it, which is taking the equation and integrating it times e to the minus, let's say, uh, let's say a to p squared times all of this stuff integrated over p squared, that's the Laplace transform from zero to infinity, then this renormalization group equation becomes a lot simpler and you get mu dj d mu is equal to alpha s minus two, some anomalous dimension, ln q squared e to the Euler macaroni constant, eta mu squared minus two gamma j, I think, j tilde of, of nu. So this should be a tilde right here. So the renormalization group equation becomes local. You get all this, these functions and whatnot factored out times this j of nu mu. So it has a simpler functional form. It's no longer containing integrals in it as well. It's just a differential equation again. So I want to show how that's 
simplifies in Laplace space. Then once I have these new differential equations, I actually want to solve them in Laplace space and then put everything back into a cross section and have a nice plot at the end of the day. Anyways, but if you're interested in learning more about that problem, if this would be something you'd be interested in seeing solved in a future video, let me know because I need the practice anyways. But okay, time to give a review of the paper like screen protector. For me, the most important feature, the most important thing I would be looking for if I'm a physics student or someone having to do math all the time, I am looking for something that can reject the palm, basically. I, if I'm writing something and my palm gives a little nudge on the screen, I don't want the tablet to freak out and send me to a settings tab. I want it to stay where it's at. And so when I was writing these equations for you all, I was purposefully kind of trying to get in my own way to see like, oh, if I'm in a rush to write down an equation, does it pick up some wrong movement and then mess up what I'm trying to do? And so I'd like to be able to write and think and stop and, and continue, continue onto multiple lines. And I was absolutely able to do that with paper-like and that's what's 100% most important to me. And bear in mind that all of this was on the 10.9 inch iPad. So smaller than a sheet of paper, less real estate, more cramped, and it still dealt with all of those crazy Physics symbols pretty well, I would say. Big thanks again to Paperlike for sponsoring this video. Go pick yourself up a two-pack like I did or check out their digital planners. You can do all this by checking the link in the description. So thanks again, Paperlike. So back to the video. Okay, so that was a sneaky segue into the sponsored portion, but the Fourier transform stuff is important for my research, and so we're able to relate these form factors to the densities by doing the Fourier transform numerically, but one issue with that is that the integrals go out to infinity, and my computer doesn't do that. And how well your integrals converge uh, depends on things like how you truncate the integral, how you cut it off, how you sample the space, and I'd like to have reliable results that don't take 10 years to evaluate. Now what's interesting about all that is a couple months ago I actually flew out to DC for the first uh, collaboration meeting that I recently joined, and I'll talk about that research collaboration in a future video, but the reason I bring it up is because there were a couple grad students there who were interested and worked on a very similar problem, numerical Fourier transforms for physics, and they were nice enough to share their code with me to try and implement into the problem I'm trying to solve. Now that's just, it's so, I don't use the word serendipity very much, but that is a serendipitous event if I've ever seen one, because you can't plan that. You just gotta show up to the event and see what you get out of who you talk to. So that was, that was awesome to see that now I actually have uh, numerical options available. So while I'm chipping away at that, I'm also writing the paper. Thankfully, really early on in grad school, I started trying to solve my homework problems in LaTeX as opposed to solving them on paper or solving on them on paper and then moving them over to LaTeX. Uh, I find that if I'm solving something on paper, then what's on paper is the work that I did. Whereas if I'm typing things up, then what goes onto the page is the work I did plus explanations and comments and references and where did I find this equation? How do I interpret these things? I say more to myself when I type it up and so I, I really don't solve it on paper and then transfer it over onto the computer. I solve it in LaTeX and use scratch paper whenever I need it. And so in grad school, when I would prepare for exams, as, once I started doing this, exams became a lot less stressful because really everything that I needed was in my homeworks as clearly as I could describe it to myself. And now that I'm not working on homework and preparing for exams and working on writing a paper, a lot of those good habits that I picked up, I think, from doing my homeworks that way translated into writing this paper. And I, again, I don't feel that stressed out because it's all already there for the most part. I've just been able to start a new document and then kind of copy and paste the most important equations into it and then just fill in what it all means in between. And I, like I said, I, I also already have a lot of these interpretations and explanations filled in in the notes to begin with. I also have a section that was motivated by uh, my research advisor, which is called Andrew's Wild Speculation section because I kept coming to him with these kind of half-baked ideas of how you could derive certain things or shortcuts in the calculation, how variables could be related that I didn't have fully fleshed out yet, but I wanted to still think about it and discuss it. And so I also have this, this section in my notes where nothing in there needs to be correct. It's just a place where I can think and imagine and play with stuff and oh, that actually went somewhere, take it out of the speculation tab and put it in the actual notes. So I found that that's been a useful uh, uh, section to include in my notes as well. 
So the paper is going really well so far. Uh, we've also been talking back and forth with another group over in Connecticut who's interested in a very similar project. And so it's been unique. It's been a unique experience actually getting to talk to another grad student who's doing the day-to-day -day work and I can just immediately talk shop with. And so it's, it's felt like really efficient communication and it's exciting to think that I'll be able to do that with more topics than just the energy momentum tensor one day. Now this project is not the only project I'm working on, uh, so my attention has been a bit divided, but you know what they say. United we stand, and divided we will not fall. Something like that. <laughs> so I would like to hit the gas in the next few months to try to finish this paper once I have a little bit more time on my hands. But I am currently away at Los Alamos National Lab uh, where I'm continuing, I guess you could call it a student internship that I started last year where I've just been spending my time so far learning something called soft collinear effective theory. Now last year when I was here for three months, it was all about learning how to calculate the hard matching coefficient for matching QCD onto SCET as well as the jet and soft functions that will get fed into calculating the cross-section. Now this visit is all about how to treat the large logarithms that show up in these perturbative calculations and resum them using the renormalization group equations to get a more accurate fixed order calculation result and also showing how doing all of this stuff in Laplace space makes things simpler. So after I'm done with this I Imagine we will move on to a new observable where a lot of the procedure will be kind of similar to what I now know how to do. And of course there will be differences, but that's what research advisor and postdocs that I'm working under uh, will help me with and help me better understand. That way I'm not just drinking from a fire hose, learning everything all at once. I'm here for three months again. It feels great to feel part of something again, really. I feel like a kid in the candy store. I really wanna do a good job while I'm here. And I think that if I make videos on what I'm learning, uh, that could help me hold myself to a higher standard without creating a whole bunch more work for myself that's completely orthogonal to what I'm actually doing for research. So if I do start uploading a bit more regularly, there'll probably be more technical videos, uh, like that exercise that I mentioned earlier in Laplace space. They're, they're probably gonna be videos that are of more use to me than to anyone else, to be honest. But that's about all I have for an update. It's, it's crazy, these two projects are going to make up a pretty large part of my thesis, and in a year or so, I'm gonna to need to start applying to postdocs, but let's, let's, let's get the paper out first. Well, thank you for watching the video. If you have any questions or comments on what I talked about, let me know below. And huge thanks again to Paperlike for sponsoring the video. Pick yourself up a screen protector and more by checking the link in the description or going to paperlike.com slash Andrew Dotson. Bye.